welcome to lecture series on advanced geotechnical engineering and we are in module 4 which is on stress strain relationship and shear strength of soils primarily we have actually discussed about the in the previous lecture about the more circles but in this module 4 lecture 3 we will be concentrating and introducing ourselves to you know what is stress path and how these stress paths can be plotted and introduction to PQ space. In the introduction to principal stress space and stress paths in PQ space. So in this particular lecture of the module 4 we will be concentrating on principal stress space and stress paths in PQ space. So in the previous lecture we have discussed about the total stress circles and effective stress circles and we said that both in case of total stress circles total stress and effective stresses the Mohr circle diameter remains same and when the pore water pressure is positive when u is positive the total stress circle effective stress circle is on the left hand side of the total stress circle but when the pore water pressure is say negative then the effective stress circle is on the right hand side of total stress circle. So it can be seen here tau versus sigma and sigma dash and wherein the effective stress circle is actually obtained by using this half sigma 1 dash plus sigma 3 dash is equal to half sigma 1 plus sigma 3 minus u and half sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash is equal to half sigma 1 minus sigma 3. So if you look into this here the total stress and effective stress more circles have the same radius or same diameter but are separated along the sigma axis by amount equal to the pore water pressure either it is positive or negative. In case of negative the effective stress circle on tau sigma space will be on the right hand side of the total stress circle and in case if the pore water pressure is positive then the effective stress circle is on the left hand side of the total stress circle. So the total stress and effective stress more circles have the same radius and but are separated along the sigma axis by an amount equal to the pore water pressure and inability of the pore water to resist shear stress you know so that the shear stresses are resisted entirely by the contact forces between the soil. So this explanation is given you know the shear stresses are not affected by the pore pressure you know you can see that the shear stresses are not affected by the pore water pressure they are actually same both in case of total stress and effective stresses and this can be physically explained by the fact that inability of the pore water pressure to resist shear stress so that the shear stresses are resisted entirely by the contact forces between the soil grains only. So you know we can see that we can see from this you know graph and then for the discussion we had in the previous lecture we can understand that the shear stresses are not affected by the pore water pressure. So this can be explained physically by the fact that inability of the pore water pressure to resist shear stress and so that the shear stresses are resisted entirely by the contact forces between soil grains. So now let us introduce ourselves to principal stress space. So the principal stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 experienced by a point in our soil continuum can be used as Cartesian coordinate to define D in a three dimensional space and which is actually called as principal stress space. The principal stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 experienced by a point in our soil continuum can be used as Cartesian coordinates to define a point D in a three dimensional space and which is actually called as principal stress space. So we have said that sigma 1 which is the major principal stress and sigma 3 is the minor principal stress and sigma 2 is the intermediate principal stress. So this point in the principal stress space only displays the magnitude of the principal stresses and cannot fully represent the stress tensor because the three data establishing the directions of the you know directions of the principal stresses are not included. So the point in the principal stress space you know display the magnitudes of the principal stresses and cannot fully represent the stress tensor because the three data establishing the directions of the principal stresses are not included. Now let us consider for example a case of the point D 
uh, where you know it has actually has coordinates like along sigma 1 12 and along sigma 2 axis 6 units and along sigma 3 axis let us say it has got 3 units. Then this forms the as, shown, as can be seen from this figure here and D is the point in the principal stress space where sigma 1 is in this direction and sigma 2 and sigma 3. So uh, you know this D is the you know the, uh, represented in the principal stress space with the 12 units of along sigma 1 axis and 6 units along sigma 2 axis 3 units along the uh, sigma 3 axis. Now this principal stress space the, the division of principal stress tensor into spherical and the deviatoric parts can be done like this within the matrix 12 6 3 which is equal to matrix of 6 sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 and uh, which is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 by 3 into matrix of 1 1 1 plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 by 3 uh, where matrix with 0 1 minus 1 plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 by 3 with matrix of minus 1 0 1 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 3 and 1 minus 1 0. So uh, by putting uh, the respective units like for sigma 1 12 uh, the units which we have which we have uh, defined here 12 6 3 in the example here then we actually get sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 and once we get simplified by that this 7 will come then sigma 2 minus sigma 3 and uh, sigma 3 minus sigma 1 and sigma 1 minus sigma 2 after simplification we this represents you know the matrix like uh, 7 7 7 plus matrix of 0 1 minus 1 plus 3 0 minus 3 plus 2 minus 2 0. So this represents in the principal stress space uh, OA, AB, BC, uh, CD uh, so which is uh, nothing but OA, OA is uh, from here to here uh, which, uh, which is uh, you know has 7 units here, 7 units here, 7 units here that point A and AB uh, which is uh, which is having uh, you can say that uh, towards the uh, sigma 2 axis 1 unit here and towards the sigma 3 axis minus 1 unit here. So this is B here and then uh, when we have BC which is similarly 3 0 uh, minus 3 so that is represented here. Similarly CD which is uh, nothing but uh, which is represented here then which is equivalent to OD. So OD is nothing but what we have actually represented in the principal stress space. So the principal stress space is particularly favored for the representation of the theories of the yield strength particularly perfectly plastic materials. Uh, so the principal stress uh, space is particularly favored uh, for representation of the theories of the yield strength of perfectly plastic materials and for a perfectly plastic material the principal stress axis uh, can be converted into Cartesian axis as x is equal to 1 by root 3 sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 is equal to root 3 p and similarly y is equal to 1 by root 2 sigma 2 minus sigma 1 and z is equal to 1 by root 6 2 sigma 3 minus sigma 2 minus sigma 1. So the principal stress space is you know particularly favored for representation of the theories of the yield strength of the of perfectly plastic materials. Now let us look uh, the introduction to the stress paths in PQ space. So before that let us uh, consider uh, you know two examples uh, you know we have uh, on the left hand side uh, in the figure uh, two marbles or which can be represented like a two spherical grains uh, which are actually uh, you know uh, in figure, figure on the left hand side here uh, which is actually on the one grain is sitting on the other and assume that there is a vertical force is acting in the direction of the vertical direction. And in this case uh, you know the grain which is uh, uh, bottom grain is uh, has the same position but upper grain is actually being pushed with a, a force applied at an angle theta the force applied at an angle theta. So uh, in order to represent this one let us say that we keep on increasing this from 0 to certain f then uh, the, the path of this load what we say that the direction the, the load path or force path traverses from 0 to A in this direction that means that in the vertical direction. In this case the force is actually applied at an angle which is theta so which actually traverses in this direction so this is for 
the path of the you know the uh, you know uh, the experience by this marble where it can undergo tilting it can undergo riding and depending upon the, the frictional interaction between the two grains. So line OA is called the load path or force path and the line OB represents a uh, line OB represents a load path for uh, you know the example which is actually shown here with a force applied at an angle. So it is important to note that the response stability and failure of the system depends on the force path. So uh, for the point B where uh, which actually has got uh, the y intercept of phi and phi f sin theta x intercept of f cos theta that is actually represented here. So the in this particular example when the in the for the two grains which are either grains spherical grains or marbles when it is actually applied a force in the vertical direction the load path is actually shown here and similarly the load path OB is actually shown with a force applied at an angle theta and this is for the force applied at an angle. Now we know that soils of course are not marbles but the underlying principle is same. So when you extend this principle the soil fabric can be thought of as a space frame with the soil particles representing the members of the frame. So soil particles representing the members of the frame and the particle contacts representing the joints. So here what we are having is that the soil fabric can be thought of as a space frame with the soil particles representing the members of the frame and the particle contacts representing joints. So the response stability and failure of the soil fabric or the space frame depend upon the, the stress path to which the soil specimen or soil mass is subjected. So what we have done is that from the example whatever we have taken for the spherical grains or marble grains we are connecting to you know the from the our soil where the soil fabric and is you know assumed as a space frame. Uh, you know the soil fabric means the particle arrangement is assumed as a space frame with the soil particles representing the members of the frame and particle contact points are represented as the joints. So the frame which is actually connected with the joints and this is uh, these uh, joints are actually represented in the soil as the contact points at the grain to grain contacts and as members are actually represented by soil particles. So the response and stability of a failure of the soil fabric or the space frame depend upon the stress path. So the stress paths are presented in a plot showing the relationship between the stress parameters and provide a convenient way to allow geotechnical engineer to study the changes in stresses in soil caused by loading conditions. So the stress paths are represented in a plot showing the relationship between stress parameters and provide a convenient, convenient way to allow geotechnical engineer to study the changes in stresses in soil caused by the different types of loading conditions and different combinations can be considered. So let us consider uh, you know uh, a isotropic compression loading condition in one uh, lo this loading condition is defined as one where in the isotropic loading condition where delta sigma 1 is equal to that means that vertical uh, stress and horizontal stress sigma is uh, sigma uh, sigma 1 delta sigma 1 and delta sigma 3 that is in the horizontal direction they both are same. So here uh, in this particular uh, chart where Q which is represented as P is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 by 3 and Q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 uh, sigma 1 minus uh, sigma 3. So uh, here uh, consider the isotropic uh, loading condition 1 so by using incremental form of the stress variance. So we can say that the stress in the stress invariant of invariance of isotropic compression R. So delta P1, delta P1 is nothing but the you know incremental increase in P1 that in the P space is equal to delta sigma 1 plus 2 delta sigma 3 because delta sigma 2 is equal to delta sigma 3. We have taken it as delta sigma 1 plus 2 delta sigma 3 by 3 is equal to where because delta sigma 3 is equal to delta sigma 1 then we are putting in uh, in terms of delta sigma 1. So because of that delta sigma 1 plus 2 delta sigma 1 by 3 which uh, simplifies to delta sigma 1 and delta q1 is equal to delta sigma 1 minus delta sigma 3 which is equal to delta sigma 1 minus delta sigma 1 so it is 0 and the stress variance uh, at the end of the loading 1 r so it increments with p naught. 
so p0 plus uh, delta p1 so where p0 is equal to 0 initial uh, conditions are 0 so delta sigma 1 that delta p1 is equal to delta sigma 1 and q1 is equal to q0 plus delta q1 both in initial and uh, at the end of the loading they both are same so in that case uh, what will happen is that q1 is 0 so the the stress path for this loading condition where isotropic compression is involved it traverses from O to A so it traverses from O to A where the slope of this line is equal to 0 because delta sigma 1 that is delta sigma 1 delta q1 by delta p1 so delta q1 is equal to 0 and delta p1 is delta sigma 1 so 0 by delta sigma 1 it is 0. So the slope of this line is 0 and this is OA is equal to stress path for the loading 1 that is loading 1 is isotropic compression which is indicated on the where we have got the stresses which are identical in uh, uh, you know uh, all directions then that is uh, you know indicated uh, as uh, path OA. So if you are having uh, earth pressure at rest condition and with K0 is equal to 1 let us say and uh, then in that case vertical stress is equal to horizontal stress in that case with isotropic kind of compression conditions are uh, simulated then you know the, the stress path actually is along this P, P line along the P axis along the P axis with the delta Q is equal to 0. So this is for uh, you know uh, for this uh, OA which is for isotropic com uh, compression let us consider the loading, loading condition 2 where sigma 3 is constant sigma 3 is constant that means that uh, uh, there is a sigma 3 which is applied but there is no change in delta sigma 3 the sigma 3 is constant means rate of change of delta sigma 3 is constant that uh, so delta sigma 3 is equal to 0 which is the loading condition is indicated within 2 here and delta sigma 1 is greater than 0 that means that once we held with certain uh, uh, sigma 3 with uh, without a constant sigma 3 then you know the we increase the, the pressure. So in that case uh, this loading condition is 2 where sigma 3 is equal to constant and with the delta sigma 3 is equal to 0 but continue to increase uh, sigma 1 in that case the increase in the stress variance for loading 2 r delta p2 is equal to delta sigma 1 plus 2 into delta sigma 3 that is uh, delta sigma 3 is equal to 0 so what we have is the delta sigma 1 by 3 and delta q2 is equal to delta sigma 1 minus delta sigma 3 delta sigma 3 is equal to 0 so what we have delta sigma 2 is equal to uh, delta sigma 1 and the stress variant at the end of the loading 2 or p2 is equal to p1 plus delta p2 where p1 is uh, uh, obtained as uh, delta sigma 1 that is here in this case in the previous condition delta sigma 1 and uh, delta sigma 1 by 3 so this simplifies to uh, 1 plus 4 by 3 into delta sigma 1 uh, so with uh, simplifies to 4 by 3 into delta sigma 1 and q2 is equal to q1 plus delta q2 which is nothing but q1 initially uh, we have seen in the previous case q1 is equal to 0 so what we can say that uh, q1 is equal to 0 plus delta q2 is equal to uh, you know what we have uh, done here increase in the stress variant for the type of loading condition which we have considered it is uh, delta sigma 1 so q2 is equal to delta sigma 1 so ab is the stress path for the loading 2 ab is the stress path for the loading 2 ab is the stress path for the loading 2 and uh, the slope of the stress path ab is delta q2 by delta p2 delta q2 is delta sigma 1 and delta p2 is uh, delta sigma 1 by 3 so um, you know by simplifying this what we get is the uh, 3 so that means that the slope which is uh, you know which actually has got 3 vertical 1 horizontal 3 vertical 1 horizontal is the slope for this line stress path uh, from A to B for the condition where the loading where delta sigma 3 is equal to 0 and uh, sigma 1 is continued to increase. So this is for a type of loading condition as can be seen uh, this is the initial condition isotropic compression and then there is an increase like this this is the stress path and for the next to this thing what we do loading condition 3 where delta sigma 1 is equal to 0 but we continue to increase let us say delta sigma 3 that means that we are uh, rate of change of uh, delta sigma 1 is uh, not there delta sigma 1 is maintained constant that is uh, sigma 1 is maintained constant delta sigma 1 is equal to 0 in that case here what we are doing is that we are actually trying to see some sort of uh, you know expansion uh, 
uh, where delta sigma 3 is actually uh, some, uh, it also represents something like a squeezing. So in this case for the loading 3 uh, what will happen is that uh, sigma 1 is constant that means that delta sigma 1 is equal to 0 but continue to increase delta sigma, uh, sigma 3 and that means that delta sigma 3 is greater than 0. So increase in the stress variance for loading 3 are uh, delta P3 is equal to 0 plus uh, that is delta sigma 1 is equal to 0 plus uh, 2 delta 3 uh, divided 2 sigma delta sigma 3 divided by 3 which uh, is simplifies to 2 by third of delta sigma 3 and delta Q3 is equal to 0 minus uh, delta Q sigma 3 which is uh, uh, which is nothing but uh, uh, 0 minus delta sigma 3. So there is an increase delta sigma 3 is being increased. Uh, so uh, you know delta Q3 is equal to minus delta sigma 3 and the stress variance at the end of loading uh, 3 are P3 is equal to P2 plus delta, delta P3 is equal to 4 by 3 delta sigma 1. Uh, P2 was obtained has here in this case P3 is obtained has 4 by 3 delta sigma 1, 4 by 3 delta sigma 1 plus 2 by 3 delta sigma 3 which is actually delta P3 here. So Q3 is equal to Q2 plus delta Q3 delta Q3 Q2 was obtained as delta sigma 1. So by substituting here delta sigma 1 minus delta sigma 3 uh, you know with delta sigma 1 is equal to 0 what we will have is minus delta sigma 3. So this BC the stress path for the loading 3 uh, which is uh, shown here the stress path for the loading 3 is uh, in this direction. So you can see that uh, this path now takes a downward turn here because the loading condition here is that there is no change in sigma 1 that is delta sigma 1 change rate of change of sigma 1 is 0 delta sigma 1 is 0 but delta sigma 3 is being increased that is greater than 0. So with that you can see that how the stress path the slope of the stress path BC is nothing but delta Q3 by delta P3 which is nothing but minus delta sigma 3 by 2 third of delta sigma 3 with that what we get is the minus 3 by 2. So minus 3 by 2 the slope is actually is indicated here. 3 vertical 2 horizontal that is the slope which actually runs down here for uh, stress path BC for the loading condition where delta sigma 1 uh, is 0 sigma 1 is not uh, uh, sigma 1 is constant and uh, delta sigma 1 is 0 and uh, delta sigma 3 is continued to uh, that is greater than 0. So that is for loading condition uh, 3. But uh, till now uh, this is an example which we have taken and then we try to plot uh, the stress paths but uh, when we connect it to the soil when it is under drained condition or undrained condition it can be under during uh, uh, consolidation stage uh, if uh, the drainage is allowed then uh, the, con the consolidation takes place and during uh, shearing if the drainage is not allowed then uh, the excess pore water pressure uh, develops and uh, this is also depends upon the uh, the type of the soil if you are having normally consolidated soil uh, then you have a positive pore water pressure and uh, when we have war consolidated soil there can be possibility that uh, you know the negative pore water pressures they do develop. So if the soil pore water is allowed to drain from the soil sample the increase in the stress carried by the pore water is called as excess pore water pressure delta U will continuously decrease uh, to 0 and the soil solids will have to support all the. Uh, support all of the increase in the applied stresses. So if the soil pore water pressure is allowed to drain from the uh, soil sample and the increase in the uh, you know the stress carried out by the pore water is called the excess pore water pressure and will continue this excess pore water pressure will continue to decrease g to 0 and the soil solids will have to support the all the increase uh, all the pressure which is increased by the uh, increase in the applied stresses. Now let us assume that loading condition 1 represents the isotropic consolidation and since the excess pore water pressure delta U1 dissipates as the pore water pressure drains from the soil the mean effective stress at the end of each increment of loading 1 is equal to the mean total stress because delta P1 dash is equal to delta P1 minus delta U1 and at the end of consolidation because when the pore water pressure excess pore water pressure which is generated is dissipates to delta U1 when it is tending to 0 then we can say that uh, delta P1 dash is equal to delta P1 which is nothing but uh, you know which is both the effective stress path uh, uh, ESP and total stress path uh, uh, you know both are identical for the isotropic consolidation and which is represented by OA that is for during isotropic consolidation both uh, OA represents for the uh, effective stress path as well as for the 
total stress path. So in case of isotropic consolidation the slope of the stress path which is 0 and which is along the P or P dash axis and which actually the effective stress path and total stress path you know paths stress paths are identical and they follow in one line and this is for the total stress path and effective stress path for the isotropic consolidation. Now assume that during loadings 2 and 3 the sample is undrained. Now during loading and loading during loadings in 2 and 3 the sample is undrained then we can see how things will change. Now let us assume that if the during loading so this this is you know AB represents the stress path for total stress path and BC what we have deduced that is for the total stress path and then for effective stress path with sample remains undrained you know the effective stress path traverses from A to B dash and the effective stress path for this condition where delta sigma 1 is equal to 0 and delta sigma 3 greater than 0 the effective stress path traverses vertically down with slope almost 90 degrees you can see that BC dash and AB dash AB dash for the loading condition where delta sigma 3 is equal to 0 and where delta sigma 3 is greater than 0 you can see that how the this path traverses downwards like this and this traverses upwards like this. But however this we will discuss while you know after having introduced the triaxial tests. For the stress paths in PQ space stress variable S and T are the two dimensional variables that do not capture the effect of sigma 2 and the whereas the mechanical response of soil is mainly expressed in terms of P and Q which are defined as the following follow which are defined which are defined as follows in terms of principal stresses. So this P and Q mechanical response of soil is mainly expressed by taking into sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 and the stress variables S and T are basically they are two dimensional variables and basically they do not capture the effect of sigma 2 and the, the thus the P and Q are normal and shear stresses that are representative of the three dimensional state stress state at a point. So the P and Q are the normal and shear stresses and that are representative of the three dimensional stress state at a point where P is given by 1 by 3 sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 Q is equal to 1 by root 2 root over sigma 1 minus sigma 3 whole square plus sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole square plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 whole square. So in the two dimensional when you wanted to convert let us say that so this this is in terms of Q which is 1 by root 2 into root over sigma 1 minus sigma 3 whole square plus sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole square plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 whole square. Now let us say that we have a more circle with sigma 1 as the major principal stress and sigma 3 as the minor principal stress and sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is the diameter of the Mohr circle and the center of the Mohr circle on the sigma axis at a distance sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 and let us assume that this is the stress point ST and the point here we can see that this point A which is the you know which is nothing but the you know when you join the pole here this is the major shear stress plane this is called the major shear stress plane the major shear stress plane and sigma 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 this coordinate of this point is along the p x sigma axis it is sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 along the tau axis it is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. So when you have let us say you know with the constant sigma 3 let us say that when sigma 1 is increasing then in that case what will happen is that one with the constant sigma 3 you know the more more circle actually traverses like this. So you will actually get sigma 1 1 1 sigma 1 sigma 1 1 2 sigma 1 1 3 like this. So whenever we actually join these points which are actually of maximum shear stress then that indicates something like you know when you join this line and this is actually inclined at 45 degrees. So a stress path is a plot in tau sigma or tau sigma space of the progression of st points 
that means that when different states of soil stress states of the soil and the final stress state can be at failure final stress state can be at failure and uh, representing the loading process of a uh, on a sample. So uh, you know this is one stress point which is actually shown here but when we have got uh, number of series of Mohr circles and they represent uh, each and every time the Mohr circle is actually having new diameter and, uh, uh, and uh, new stress points and but when you join these two and that actually represents the, the so called uh, the stress path for this condition which is actually being defined. So uh, a stress path basically is a plot uh, which is uh, uh, drawn in the tau sigma space which is connecting a progression of S and T points where S is equal to uh, S and T which we have defined from the two dimensional point of view representing the loading process on a sample. So where you have uh, uh, you know the S is equal to of sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 and T is equal to of uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. So this is uh, again uh, shown here uh, with uh, you know different notation which is uh, uh, you know P is nothing but uh, S here. P is nothing but S here S is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 T is nothing but Q here sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. So the representative of the successive states, states of the stress as sigma 1 increases with sigma 3 constant. So when you have the uh, you know sigma 3 constant and this is for more circle A, more circle B, more circle C, more circle D, more circle E. So a series of more circles. So the representation of the successive states of the stress as sigma 1 increases with sigma 3 constant points A, B, C, D, E uh, they represent the same stress conditions in both the diagrams. So uh, this uh, you know points which are actually uh, you know because it is not possible to indicate uh, the number of circles when we do the conditions with the different uh, sigma 3 um, sigma 3 values. So when you will be, you will be having a number of uh, more circles on the tau sigma space. So that is difficult and can lead to confusion. So for that what it is actually simplified is that the stress path only simplifies uh, you know a path where it point joining uh, uh, you know uh, the points where the maximum shear stress, uh, the, uh, maximum shear stress uh, on the Mohr circle is generated. So that points actually are picked up here and the A, B, C, D, E is actually known as the stress path for the uh, condition where with the sigma 3 constant and sigma 1 increases. So this is ST diagram or QP diagram where Q is equal to sigma 1 sigma 3 by 2 and Q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 where Q is equal to also T is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. So the duplication of successive uh, states of stress that exist in a space one is represented by a series of Mohr circle that is what we have discussed. And, uh, plot with the series of stress points and connect these points is connect when you connect these points is called as a stress path the locus of the stress points you can also call this is also called as the locus of the stress points. So the plot this is a stress path is nothing but a plot with a series of stress points and connecting this point the connect the these point when you connect these points and that is called as a stress path which is here indicated again as you know A. Um, a, B, C, D, E which is actually inclined at 45 degrees because this is nothing but the plane of tau max and uh, 45 degrees to the principal plane. So the principal plane major principal plane is here and minor principal plane is here. So it is actually 45 degrees 45 degrees to the principal plane. So in this case if you look into it uh, this is the major uh, principal plane and this is the minor principal plane. So this stress path for this condition is inclined at 45 degrees to the principal plane. So the plane of tau max so this is nothing but the plane of tau max and 45 degrees to the principal plane. So the stress path represents the state of stress and successive states of stress and the stress path need not be a straight line depending upon how we actually varied the incremental stresses sometimes we can actually vary nonlinearly also in that case the stress path actually is also formed as a curve. So stress path need not be a linear version it can be also uh, need not be a straight line it can be uh, non-linear also. So here uh, uh, when we have that uh, ds which is nothing but uh, uh, small change uh, uh, in 
uh, sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 that is of d sigma 1 by dS is indicated as uh, d sigma 1 plus d sigma 3 by 2 and dt is indicated as of d sigma 1 minus d sigma 3 when sigma 1 changes d sigma 3 is equal to 0 when sigma 1 changes when sigma 1 changes that means that you are actually con you are having sigma 3 but uh, d sigma 3 is 0 then in that case uh, ds is equal to uh, of d sigma 1 and dt is equal to of d sigma 1. So you can see that ds and dt both are same ds and dt are both are same uh, ds and dt are both are same the change in uh, uh, you know ds and change in dt both are same when sigma 3 changes and d sigma 1 is equal to 0 then ds is equal to d sigma 3 by 2 and dt is equal to minus uh, uh, 1 by 2 into d sigma 3 so dt is equal to so in if you look into here uh, if you look into here uh, in this direction sigma 3 is unchanged uh, uh, sigma 3 unchanged uh, here so and sigma 1 increase then the path goes like this sigma 1 increase the path goes like this and uh, sigma 3 unchanged sigma 1 decreased then the path comes down like this and when you have uh, uh, sigma 1 unchanged that is d sigma 1 is equal to 0 and sigma 3 decreases that means that you are actually releasing the uh, confining pressure then this comes down like this when you have sigma 1 unchanged there is certain sigma 1 and sigma 3 is continuous then the path actually goes down 0 here. So it, the stress path actually changes from this direction either this side or this side depending upon how the sigma 1 sigma 3 the stress conditions which are actually changing on the sample. So in this particular slide what we have tried to explain is that ds is equal to of d sigma 1 plus d sigma 3 by 2 and dt is equal to of d sigma 1 minus d sigma 3 by 2. So here when sigma 3 changes and only d sigma 3 is equal to 0 then ds is equal to d sigma 1 by 2 and dt is equal to d sigma 1 by 2 when only sigma 3 changes d sigma 1 is equal to 0 then ds is equal to d sigma 3 by 2. Uh, only sigma 3 changes and d sigma 1 that no change sigma 1 remains uh, unchanged sigma 1 remains unchanged then dt is equal to shear stress actually decreases so you can say that uh, this is you can see that the path is actually coming down uh, see here this is uh, coming down. So all possible stress paths when only one of the sigma 1 or sigma 3 changes are straight lines at 45 degrees with the horizontal with the dt by ds is equal to 1 uh, when uh, sigma 1 alone changes when dt by ds is equal to minus 1 when sigma 3 alone changes. So here important point to be noted here is that all possible stress paths when, when only one of the sigma 1 or sigma 3 changes are straight lines at 45 degrees and with horizontal and with dt by ds is equal to 1 the dt by ds is equal to 1 dt by ds is equal to 1 when sigma 1 alone changes and dt by ds is equal to 1 when sigma 3 alone changes. So this you know observation need to be noted. Now let us take an example problem where we have got initial condition which is hydrostatic condition sigma v is equal to sigma h you have got a some cylindrical sample where you have applied vertical stress and uh, you know horizontal stress that means that the sample is uh, confined with uh, in hydrostatic uh, pressure which is actually having uh, that means that the sample is actually with a pressurized uh, uh, system and then it will be subjected to sigma v in vertical direction sigma h in horizontal direction but when the sigma when it is uh, when it is uh, with the hydrostatic condition the sigma v is equal to sigma h and during loading or unloading it can be like uh, uh, you know when you have the initial conditions and this uh, it can uh, sigma v, delta sigma v can increase or you can actually have uh, delta sigma h can increase or decrease that means that here when uh, when you have it, the conditions are that that during loading and unloading the sample will be experienced in uh, something like increasing in delta sigma 1 decreasing delta sigma 1 and or uh, when this is maintained constant there is a there, there is uh, increase in the delta sigma h or decrease in the delta sigma h. So the stress paths for this case uh, with the different stress points uh, paths for initially hydrostatic condition. So as we have said that initially hydrostatic condition means you know that path actually starts along the p axis 
or uh, this is S is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 Q is equal to uh, T is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. So uh, you can see that we have got different paths now A that is the uh, if this is uh, let us say a point T, T A, T B, T C, T D, T E and T F are the different uh, stress paths and out of this you can see that path A which is with the condition delta sigma h is equal to delta sigma v and path b what we have done is that we have maintained delta sigma h is equal to half delta sigma v half delta sigma v and in, in stress path c uh, what we have done is that delta sigma h is equal to 0 and delta sigma v is increasing that is what we have discussed in the previous example and path d where delta sigma h is equal to minus delta sigma v here we are actually maintaining delta sigma h as minus delta sigma v and e where delta sigma h decreases and delta sigma v is equal to 0 that means that there is a certain sigma v on the sample and uh, the delta sigma h is being decreased and in path f where delta sigma h increases and delta sigma v decreases. So uh, this example uh, you know this is the you know the solution for uh, this example problem when you actually have got uh, you know variable loading conditions and this uh, can be worked out like this. The initial conditions of the uh, for all the soil uh, all the stress paths are P0 is equal to uh, sigma V plus sigma H by 2 and with that uh, sigma V is equal to sigma H. Uh, so this is equivalent to when, when you have sigma V is equal to sigma H uh, which is nothing but P0 is equal to sigma V or sigma H and Q0 is equal to 0 uh, and the final conditions are uh, which can be given as uh, final condition which is indicated for QF is nothing but sigma sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma h plus delta sigma h by 2 and pf is equal to sigma v plus delta sigma v plus sigma h plus delta sigma h by 2. So uh, when we have uh, you know this when we substitute for these conditions what we have for this stress path A in order to obtain the stress path A what we do we have, what we have been uh, given the loading condition is that uh, you know initially sigma v is equal to sigma h and delta sigma v is equal to delta sigma h that means that sigma qf is equal to sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma v because sigma h is equal to delta sigma v minus delta sigma v by 2. So with that what we have got is that qf is equal to 0 what we have got qf is equal to 0 and pf which is sigma v plus delta sigma v plus sigma h I substituted as sigma v and delta h sigma delta sigma h as sigma v, delta sigma v. So when I substitute this which is nothing but 2 into sigma v plus delta sigma v by 2 that gets simplified to sigma v plus delta sigma v. So we can see that the stress path the stress path A moves out of the p axis by an amount equivalent to delta sigma v is equal to delta sigma h that means that the stress path which is you know if you take q by delta q by delta pf it is 0 0 by delta sigma v. So that means that the stress path actually traverses along this and it moves by a distance delta sigma h is equal to delta sigma v and this is nothing but the, the qf and pf are nothing but the coordinates where qf is equal to 0 that means that is on the point is on the p axis or s axis which, uh, which is nothing but s is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2. Similarly we have uh, uh, you know the stress path B the initial conditions are same but uh, uh, what we have done is here is that delta sigma h is equal to delta sigma v by 2 that means that delta sigma h is equal to delta sigma by 2 the stress path B is actually traversing at an inclination of you can see that 18.4 degrees. So in order to deduce this uh, we, we follow the same uh, conditions here uh, qf is equal to sigma v plus delta sigma v by, uh, minus sigma h plus delta sigma h by 2 and pf is equal to sigma v plus uh, delta sigma v plus sigma h plus delta sigma h by 2. Now for substituting uh, 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 sigma h is equal to sigma v initially so sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma v minus uh, uh, delta sigma v by 2 because delta sigma h is equal to delta sigma by 2. So with that what we got is that 1 by 4 delta sigma v and similarly pf is equal to when you simplify this we get sigma v plus 3 by 4 delta sigma v. So these points are nothing but the coordinates of the at the end of the stress path qf and pf are the uh, 
points coordinates of the at the end of the stress path B and Q and P both increase by delta sigma V by 4 and uh, 3 delta sigma V by 4. So both are actually increasing you can see that this is increased by uh, delta sigma V by 4 and this is increased by delta 3 by 4 of delta sigma V by 4. This implies that the stress path has a slope of uh, you can see that this by this what Q by P we get uh, the slope as 1 by 3 or 18.4 degrees. So hence we can actually draw now this stress path B uh, if T, T B as the you know with an incline uh, and with the coordinates of uh, uh, what we discuss is 1 by 4 uh, delta sigma V and then 3 by 4 uh, uh, delta sigma V it is increased by that much amount and then that is the you know stress path for the loading condition where delta sigma H is equal to delta sigma V by 2. The third loading condition here for stress path C is delta sigma H is equal to 0 that is no change in the sigma H but the sigma V continue to increase. So this we have discussed but again we will actually solve this by using the method which you have discussed just now with the delta sigma H is equal to 0 and delta sigma V greater than 0 that is increases by some amount. Then we can actually substitute here QF is equal to when you substitute sigma V plus delta sigma V minus sigma V by 2 because delta sigma h is equal to 0 it gets 0 so it becomes delta sigma v by 2 and pf is equal to sigma v plus delta sigma v plus sigma v by 2. So this also increases by amount you can see that both their qf and pf they are the coordinates of stress path c and both increase by magnitudes which is equivalent to delta sigma v by 2 and delta sigma v by 2. So this implies that the slope is 1 so q by p which is 1 which implies that the slope actually the stress path actually has got a slope of 45 degrees. So now this uh, Tc which is the condition where uh, where this delta sigma h no change in the cell pressure and uh, that is the lateral horizontal pressure and delta sigma v increases and that is nothing but uh, this stress uh, path Tc where the coordinates of this uh, uh, which increased by the point which is what we have shown as delta sigma 1 by sigma v by 2 and delta sigma v by 2. Now, now we have stress point D. So in this stress path D the condition what has been maintained is that delta sigma h is nothing but minus delta sigma v. Stress the stress path D where the condition here is maintained is that delta sigma h is minus delta sigma v. So by using the same principles substituting in this uh, and uh, uh, writing uh, here with uh, sigma h is equal to sigma v and uh, you know when we when we put this what is happened is that you actually have uh, it increased by delta sigma v so this actually has increased by delta sigma v and uh, and this uh, point is nothing but sigma v plus delta sigma v uh, plus uh, uh, we have uh, sigma v uh, minus delta sigma v uh, because the delta h delta sigma h is equal to minus delta sigma v. So with that we what we get is that uh, you know the, these two will get cancelled then what we have is that uh, 2 sigma v by 2 which is nothing but sigma v. So the values of uh, p q are the coordinates of the end of the stress path d and q p uh, uh, both increase by delta sigma v and the sigma v and this implies that uh, the stress path uh, D has a slope of 90 degrees. So that is the reason why you can see that this stress path is actually traversing vertically up. The traversing vertically up with a coordinate here. What you can see is that delta when delta sigma h is equal to minus delta sigma v, it is actually traversing up here, with a 90 degree slope. So for E, let us consider for stress path E where delta sigma v is equal to 0 that is the change in vertical stress is 0 but in this cell pressure delta sigma h is actually decreased by some amount. So by using the same principles where qf is equal to sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma h plus delta sigma h by 2 by substituting here what we have what we will get is that sigma v plus 0 that is delta sigma v is equal to 0 minus sigma v uh, minus delta sigma h by 2 so wherein we get qf is equal to delta sigma h uh, by 2 and pf is equal to sigma v plus 0 plus uh, sigma v minus delta sigma h by 2 uh, wherein we have got uh, sigma v plus delta sigma h by 2. So 
we can see that uh, the values of q and p are increased both by delta sigma h by 2. So this implies that uh, the slope of E uh, has a slope of minus 1 and 45 degrees. So this traverses for this load condition which is uh, what we have discussed is that like this. So when uh, delta sigma h decreases and uh, with delta sigma h decreases sigma h decreases with delta sigma which goes 0 you can see that this traverses in this direction uh, towards the q axis and uh, which is uh, uh, with an inclined at 45 degrees and increased by the same amount both in uh, uh, delta q and delta p and when you have delta sigma h is equal to delta sigma v uh, that is uh, when, when you have delta sigma h is equal to 0 and delta sigma v increases it traverses in this direction when you have in this direction that means that here uh, what is actually happening is that um, with a constant uh, uh, sigma 1 when you have and uh, when delta sigma h is actually the when your sample is actually losing the uh, confinement uh, that means that uh, there is a sort of uh, uh, you know the sample is subjected to a tension. So you can see that uh, that is actually happening here whereas in this case uh, where delta sigma h is actually 0 that no, there is no change in the uh, cell pressure uh, or the horizontal pressure but when delta sigma is increasing so this is actually towards the compression and this is towards the tension. So uh, you can look into this the way what we have done is that we uh, try to uh, you know see uh, you know these uh, plot these test paths uh, by actually uh, following the fundamental principles wherein uh, in this particular example wherein uh, it is subjected to initially hydrostatic conditions are considered but suppose if you are not having uh, hydrostatic conditions initially when say delta sigma v is not equal to delta sigma h or sigma v is not equal to sigma h then that means that you know the origination of the stress path location itself somewhere here and from there again it actually follows the uh, you know different uh, 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 paths can be drawn. So for the in this particular example uh, what we have considered is that uh, uh, the initial condition is hydrostatic uh, compression where we have actually sigma v is equal to sigma h and when we have this when you have got different variations of delta sigma v and delta sigma h then we have actually drawn and then we have actually also seen how this procedure can be adopted for plotting this stress paths. So you can see that here the stress paths are actually plotted and then they, they are nothing but the locus of the you know points on the Mohr circle and instead of this, this actually avoids a series of Mohr circles when you actually have different stress conditions. So the stress paths are the uh, you know the straight lines joining the locus of the stress states uh, on the Mohr circle and uh, they are actually need not be straight line and depending upon uh, how you exercise for example when you have delta sigma h is equal to half let us say delta sigma v square by half delta sigma v square then in that case uh, it can actually undertake as a curve also. So you actually get a non-linear variation also so not necessarily the straight lines. Uh, but when we have these conditions of these uh, you know delta sigma h is equal to delta sigma y by 2 and uh, when we have delta sigma h 0 and delta sigma v increases and when we have delta sigma h decreases and delta sigma v 0 then it actually follows and it is actually nothing but the, the plane of maximum shear stress wherein uh, it actually has got uh, uh, you know the mag, uh, and it actually inclined at a 45 degrees to the principal plane. So in this particular lecture what we have uh, uh, done is that uh, we discussed uh, very briefly about the principal stress space and uh, then we have tried to introduce ourselves to stress paths and uh, seen some examples where uh, how these stress paths can be plotted in PQ space or uh, ST in the two dimensional space where S is equal to Q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 and P is equal to uh, T, uh, T uh, S is equal to uh, sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2. So in further we will actually discuss on this and then uh, when we introduce ourselves to the, the triaxial compression test then we will try to see when we have got a different uh, drainage conditions undrained and drained how we can actually draw uh, effective stress paths and total stress paths and, uh, and with uh, some examples and that makes very clear.